Well, good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to see all of you here, to hear Lonnie uh, Thompson. There'll be an introduction by Dr. Terry Serling, one of our uh, star faculty here at the university. And this is the last of the Frontiers of Science series this year, so I don't have to announce the next one. Uh, I'm running late because I had grandkids to pick up and I couldn't get through traffic. So um, again, thank you all for coming. And with no further ado, let me have Terry come up and introduce Lonnie. I hear that Lonnie has a lot of slides, so you're in for a treat. Okay. Uh, my students know that I like to, uh, the, the, probably the most important writers in literature were A.A. A. Milne and Lewis Carroll. And so I'm going to start this with just a little, little bit coming from uh, Chapter 9 of Winnie the Pooh in which Piglet is entirely surrounded by water. Now, an important thing that you should know is that one of Lonnie's great colleagues is his wife, Ellen Mosley Thompson. So to start this off, uh, Piglet says, and he gave a very long sigh and said, I wish Pooh were here. It's so much more friendly with two. And then some things happen. And the rain began when Pooh was asleep and it rained and it rained and it rained and he slept and he slept and he slept. He'd had a tiring day. You remember how he discovered the North Pole? Well, he was so proud of this, he asked Christopher Robin if there were any other poles such as the bear of little brain might discover. There's a South Pole, said Christopher Robin, and I expect there's an East Pole and a West Pole, though people don't like talking about them. Pooh was very excited when he heard this, and he suggested they should have an expotition to discover the East Pole. And he later went out to try to do that. And I mention this for two reasons. One is because Lonnie has a great colleague. It is more friendly with two if you have a great colleague. And uh, Lonnie is largely responsible for working on the Earth's third pole that many of you haven't heard of, and that's what he's going to be talking about tonight. So the third pole of the Earth. So you better let them know what it is. <clears throat> uh, Lonnie uh, is uh, from, uh, was, is from uh, West Virginia, and uh, he's a farm boy, and I think that helped him with his uh, struggles at high altitudes where he runs around the world having to fix all sorts of, of equipment that doesn't work the way that it used to, or it was supposed to. And uh, he studied uh, physics and then geology, and he even started off, I think, to even with the intention of perhaps being a coal geologist being from that part of the country. Since then, uh, he kind of changed directions a bit and when he went to Ohio State and worked in Antarctica as a grad student, and then uh, spent some time in Peru in the Calcaya ice cap. And that kind of changed his uh, perspective on things and where he began to have this long-term interest in the records, the high resolution records that you could get from ice that is in the tropics. And uh, so he's been working on that for a long time and, and uh, some 30 years, I think he's had more than 60 expeditions uh, to, to tropical glaciers, of which we're going to hear tonight. He's been widely recognized. He was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Science. He won the Tyler Prize for Environmental, uh, environmental Achievement. He's uh, been a recipient of the National Medal of Science. And... Uh, and uh, something that very few people have done that who have even achieved all of those. He's even had a, a full heart transplant and was able to go up and work still at over 20,000 feet a year later. And as a result of that, Lonnie tells me he's a very strong supporter of people with disabilities. That's a great disability. And he's uh, willing to give all sorts of people a chance who don't have, uh, who have disabilities because of his experience on that. So Lonnie, Please tell us about the third pole. Thank you, Turley. I appreciate that very much. Uh, uh, I'm very fortunate to have, over the years, worked with a, a great team of people. And, and you certainly couldn't do what we've been able to do without that. This is Huascaran. It's the highest tropical mountain on Earth. It's also one of our, our drill sites. Uh, <clears throat> I want to acknowledge our current team, and uh, we work with a, we have a permanent team of uh, experts, and then we always have graduate students and, and postdocs. Uh, uh, 
uh, and visiting scientists. And of course, to do research, you have to have uh, support uh, from various agencies that allow that to happen. Uh, and more and more, we, we, we get private uh, support for what we, what we do. Uh, so I want to, I have two objectives tonight. One is to talk about glaciers as recorders of climate change. I want to talk about uh, El Nino's droughts and, and human history. Uh, this is something you can do when you go to uh, the lower latitudes where there's a long history of human beings and their activities. But I'm going to also talk about evidence for recent acceleration in the rates of ice loss. The, uh, <clears throat> But I, I've come to the conclusion about six years ago that you cannot, you will not change the tre uh, trends that we're on globally by drilling another ice core. So uh, about six years ago, I had an invitation to speak, uh, give a keynote at uh, uh, the Behavior Analyst Convention, International Convention on Studies Human Beings and Why We Do Anything. And, and I was kind of disappointed when I was preparing because uh, one of their founding fathers was B.F. Skinner. And he was very uh, optimistic about being able to understand human beings when he was young, in mental age, but by the time he was 80, uh, he had grown pessimistic about uh, being able to do this. And there were two th reasons for this that relate to climate change issues that have to do with human characteristics. Immediate consequences outweigh delayed consequences. So if you talk about climate change and you talk about 20 years or 50 years in, uh, into the future, we're kind of here and now type of people. And uh, then consequences for the individual outweigh consequences for others. And so people might get displaced in Bangladesh, but it really do doesn't affect me unless my house uh, uh, gets flooded. And, and then I want to uh, just close by talking a little bit about our options and our greatest challenges uh, in the 21st century as I see them. Uh, but first of all, the Earth is warming. There's, there's no doubt about that. We have so many different lines of evidence for that. And uh, there's an increased frequency intensity of extreme weather around the planet. And I want, I want to talk a little bit uh, also about that. Um, the, uh, and if you look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, our best understanding of the climate system suggests there will be more frequent as we go uh, into the future. Now, sometimes I, people get uh, mixed up with weather and uh, climate change, and this is probably the best figure I've seen to illustrate this. And this is a person walking a dog down the street, and the person is going in a, in a straight line, uh, but he has a dog, and the dog is going from a fire hydrant to a candy wrapper and back and forth. And so, in this uh, diagram, uh, the guy is the climate system, and we're, we're dog, he's going in one direction. And then we have uh, the dog, and that's the weather. And that's the variability in the weather. And probably Mark Twain said it best. He said that um, climate is what you expect, and weather is what you get. And, and it's, it's, it's very important uh, in our human response, because here I checked uh, February here in, in Utah, and you're, uh, the uh, climate uh, which is a 30-year average, which suggests you should have had a temperature of 35.2 degrees Fahrenheit. But in fact, it was 43.9 degrees Fahrenheit, about 9 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. Now, if you go back to Ohio and you look at February, uh, in Columbus, we should have been 32 degrees. That should have been our climate, but our actual temperature was 19.4 degrees Fahrenheit, more than 12 degrees below. Uh, of what the climate average would be. So uh, this becomes very important when you look at the world as a whole. So if you look at the February temperature distribution on the planet, you can see the red areas. There's far more warmer parts of the planet than what we have in the eastern part of the U.S. And, but uh, unfortunately, the nation's capital is right in here. And uh, you have uh, senators coming in with snowballs and saying it's, you know, it's cold outside. But uh, February was actually the second warmest February on record. And the winter, this past winter, Noah just came out a few days ago, it looks like it's going to be the warmest winter uh, on record uh, for the Northern Hemisphere. So you got to look always at the big picture and the long-term trends. 
So we have uh, very long histories coming out of the polar regions. Uh, that's where we have the largest uh, ice accumulations on the planet. But we now have uh, fairly high resolution records coming out of the tropics. And some of those records uh, go back 25,000 uh, years. And uh, of course, uh, uh, one of the things, if you work on glaciers long enough, you actually see the changes that take place. So when I was a graduate student, I took this photo. That's the, you can see the annual layers because it's a very strong, wet, dry season. And this is what it looked like in 2002. So the loss of those histories and also the loss of water resources uh, in these areas are extremely important. And in Peru, we have 70% of the world's uh, tropical glaciers and 76% uh, of their electricity comes from hydroelectricity, so they depend on these rivers and they have a very strong, wet and dry season. So uh, if you look at um, CO2 in our atmosphere, uh, this continues to arrive. Charles Keeling started this back in 1958. We're, we're at about 315 parts per million by volume. In 2012, we first time crossed 400 parts uh, uh, per million. And this year, we'll, we'll probably top out around 402 parts per million by volume. And you see this curve continues, uh, continues to rise. Uh, the ice cores and the bubbles in the ice give us this very long uh, perspective. And, and here you can actually see the CO2 uh, measurements going back 800,000 years and temperatures derived from the isotopes on those same uh, cores. And when you look at that, you can see that during times when we have big ice sheets on the planet, we have CO2 about 180, 200 parts per million by volume, and it reaches about the maximum around 300. So this is where we are today. So there are no analogs in that 800,000 year history that we have for the polar regions. But what we're really concerned about is the trajectory that we're on and how that will uh, impact our climate system uh, going forward. And it's not, it's not just CO2. Uh, we have uh, uh, other uh, uh, gases that are human derived. But we, we talk a lot about CO2 because it's a long residence time. So if you look at 800,000 years for carbon dioxide, uh, you look for at methane or nitrous oxide, you can see how we are impacting all those uh, greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere. And if you look at the residence time, CO2's, uh, once you release it, it's there for 100 to thousands of years impacting the climate. That's why we talk a lot about carbon dioxide. Methane is a very important greenhouse gas, and it's uh, increased about uh, 2.5 fold since the Industrial uh, uh, Revolution started. But its residence time is 10 to 11 years in the atmosphere. Nitrous oxide, 150 years, and the CFCs, 65 to 120 years. But all of those impact uh, uh, the temperature of, of the planet. The uh, ice cores record many different things, and so you can use them to look at the history of volcanic eruptions. So you can look at how temperatures have changed through time, how precipitation, the net balance, the annual layers have changed. But the beauty of them is they record climate history, but also record many of the forcings of climate. You can look at variations in the sun by looking at the uh, levels of beryllium-10 and uh, chlorine-36 that are preserved uh, in the ice. So they're, they're a, wonderful, a wonderful archive. And of course, to measure those cores, you need to have uh, uh, clean rooms, class 100 clean rooms, where you measure the dust and the chemistry on the cores. You have to have storage facilities. Uh, we have over 7,000 meters stored at minus 35 degrees C at uh, Ohio State. It's the only tropical collection of ice cores on Earth. And uh, uh, you have to design and build your drills. They have to be lightweight and portable to get them uh, up to high elevation. Uh, and and the, this is what makes what we do different than what goes on in Antarctica and up in Greenland, where you can have C-130s with ski-equipped planes to move equipment in. These are really remote uh, parts of the world. This is actually up on the Galia ice cap in far western China on the third pole. And uh, getting in there, the logistics are uh, very tough. And so lightweight equipment becomes extremely important. So we put a lot of effort in designing uh, lightweight drills uh, and, and material that you can get up and you can drill 200, 300 meters uh, using uh, this equipment. 
Uh, we work with all types of power supplies. We built the first solar powered ice core drill in 1983. And if you go back to 1983, the technology there was just, just beginning. And, uh, but if you take it up to 20,000 feet, even then it would perform 20 to 30 percent above manufacturer specs. So for drilling at high elevation uh, and, and in a clean environment, it was excellent. But we've also redesigned diesel engines so they'll run in cold temperatures and low oxygen environments that you have at high elevation. The other thing I get a lot of questions and from the students here, that, uh, okay, how do, you, how do you get out there? Well, we, these places, there are no roads, uh, so you go cross country, and if we're working in China, we work with uh, our, our Chinese colleagues there. Um, if you're down in the Andes, uh, you use horses uh, to trans, we have to take six tons of equipment in, uh, and we usually bring out about uh, four tons of frozen ice core, and uh, uh, that's always, always a challenge. We worked with a local businessman in National Geographic to build this hot air balloon. If you ever carry uh, 600 meters of ice core off a mountain, you always say there's gotta be a better way. And this was uh, de designed by uh, Bruce Comstock. He's the fellow who designed uh, 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 the, the balloon to fly around the world. And so he came up with this engineering, this is Steve Fawcett's, uh, uh, trip around the world. And this is, balloon is actually in five different sections. It's made so you can carry it uh, 20,000 feet and then assemble it a, and, and carry your ice cores off from the summit. And this is flying over in Kilimanjaro in Africa back in 2000. But generally we use Sherpas and porters. So we, these are the ice cores are in these tubes. And uh, if you're uh, coming down from the Himalayas, uh, when you get to the edge of the glacier, you're still 400 uh, or 4,000 feet above where vehicles can come out on the plateau. So we use whatever is available uh, in the places where we're working. So if you're in the Himalayas, these are yaks. And this is, uh, these are insulated boxes. We have uh, six meters of core in each of those boxes, so 12 meters per yak. We drill five to 600 meters. So you gotta have a whole herd of yaks. And if you have a cat, I can tell you the mentality of a yak is very similar to a cat. It's very hard to keep them going in one direction. Uh, as, and then when you get down on the plane, it goes into the trucks and you dash to Lhasa. And there we, we divide the, the, the cores with our Chinese colleagues and air cargo to Beijing, Chinese customs, Chicago, US customs, and, and we truck it down to Ohio State. So the cores are usually in transit a month after you leave uh, uh, the ice fields. So these are the places that our team has drilled over the last uh, 37 years. And the whole idea is to get the history of climate recorded in ice uh, around the planet. And uh, some of these records, this is Waskaran, which I showed at the beginning. And the drill site here is at 20,000 uh, 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 feet. And uh, getting up there, uh, you can see why uh, these lightweight portable equipment are extremely important. You know, uh, glaciers are in motion, so they're crevasses. And so six tons of equipment went up here. And 53 days later, uh, 10 tons, the frozen ice core came back down. So it takes really a dedicated army to uh, move this uh, material. Uh, this is the, actually at the drill site. And using uh, the solar power drill, we drilled two cores. We always drill two, sometimes three, so we can look at duplication of record at the site. And these were 168 meter cores. Uh, and uh, uh, the records are very high resolution in the upper part. And so this is the last 100 years and tremendous annual variations in isotopes, uh, in dust, uh, and in nitrates. If you're in the tropics, the winds here come off the Amazon. So we have a seasonal cycle and, and things like nitrate. But what was really surprising uh, about this site was this record actually went back 19,000 years. And it was the first time that ice was found on the planet in the tropics where you could look at the conditions during the last glacial stage and compare it to the last 10,000 years the Holocene period that we live in. And if you look at that history, the, the blue here is the isotope record. And the isotopes actually uh, uh, decreased by uh, about uh, eight parts per mil 
during uh, uh, the, late, the late glacial stage here. And you see the nitrates are very low, which would be consistent with lower vegetation activity in the Amazon at that period. And the dust increase is about 100 fold, which also would suggest drier conditions upwind uh, from this site. So you can get a very long history uh, uh, from, these, from these glaciers. And then you can, you can put these histories together. These, these are just isotopes. And we're going, uh, the long records from Antarctica, this is uh, going back 125,000 years. And then as you come north, uh, Sahama and Bolivia, you can see the late glacial stage here. You can see it uh, at, in Huascaran. And then you get to Kilimanjaro, and then you go north uh, into the third pole region. And if you go into northwestern Tibet, uh, you find very old ice again. And in all these cases where we have glacial stage ice, the transition is almost identical to what we find in the polar regions. So here, here is a comparison of the late glacial conditions, uh, looking at 20,000 years ago compared to modern conditions. And these are the, the isotopic changes. And you're going from Antarctica all the way uh, to Greenland. So you get this very consistent picture, very high elevations of, uh, of isotopic changes in, in the low latitudes. And that is very consistent with what we understand about uh, glacier responses in, in the tropics. So this is up in Venezuela. And this is a little ice age here, but if you look way down the valley, you can see a moraine. This is from the last glacial maximum. And the glaciers actually came down uh, over a thousand meters lower than today. And you get similar uh, uh, reconstructions if you look in East Africa or if you look uh, over in Ethiopia. Uh, and they, this suggests that the temperatures were at least five to six degrees cooler on land at these high elevation sites in the low latitudes. Uh, if, you, if you look at our world, uh, we're mainly a, a, a water world. And this is the Pacific Ocean Basin. And you can see the intertropical convergence zone here. And in today's world, that's about five degrees north of the equator. Uh, one of our most important greenhouse gases on this planet is water vapor. And it ranges from uh, less than 1% to almost 4% uh, in the atmosphere. And uh, that water vapor comes uh, into the atmosphere mainly through the tropical system. Uh, and so you can, you can see this for the year 2009 here. And we don't know a lot about, about how that's varied uh, through time, but we know that it's very important for uh, the climate processes uh, on, this, on this planet. So I'm, I'm gonna take you to the world's largest tropical ice cap. This is the Kelkaya ice cap in the uh, southern Andes of Peru. And it was the very first ice cap drilled and uh, it turned out we chose very wisely, even though we didn't know back in the 1970s how unusual this site uh, was. Uh, so, so here's the ice cap. I mean, it covered back when we started 56 square kilometers. It's at 18,750 uh, uh, feet. Okay, yeah, all right, yeah, that's, that's good, thank you. And uh, you can see the first drill going in here. These are the solar panels, these are the cables for the winch, uh, and, and they all went in uh, by horse. Uh, if you look in the crevasse here, you can see those annual dust layers. And if you go down in the crevasse, you can see how uniform these are. So if you measure the thickness of these in an ice core, you can reconstruct uh, how precipitation has changed uh, back through time. So this is um, what an ice core looks like. And we had the opportunity here to uh, go back after 20 years, uh, because when we started, we didn't have the capability of keeping the ice frozen. So we brought back 6,000 bottled water samples sealed in wax, and that was the first tropical uh, record. Uh, but this actually shows how the dating is done. Uh, these, those are the annual dust layers, so you just simply count them like you would a tree, and these go back 1,800 years uh, for, for the tropics, and you have a similar variation in the isotopes. So if you look at the last thousand years, the decadal averages of isotopes, uh, the, the, the reds are, are, are enriched isotopes, and uh, so this would be back in the medieval climate uh, uh, anomaly period. You go into the Little Ice Age, you get decreased isotopes uh, from about uh, 1540 AD up to about uh, 1880. And then you get into the 20th century and you see the enrichment taking place 
in the 20th century. This was the core that was drilled back in 1983, brought back as water samples, and this is the one from 20 years later brought back as frozen ice core. And so what's really important here is the reproducibility that you can see in that record. And because it's their annual layers, you can also look at the precipitation history over that thousand year period. And the browns here are periods of lower uh, than average precipitation. And at the onset of the Little Ice Age, it's wet and it gets dry. And the 20th century has been above average. And the, uh, if you look at the Little Ice Age, it starts out as wet. It's, 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 it's cold and wet, and then it becomes cold and dry uh, uh, as you go through that uh, period. Well, the tropics, uh, one of the, uh, the big influences in climate is the, this variation in El Nino. And this actually shows temperatures in the troposphere when we, when we start getting this warm pool forming off the uh, 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 west coast of, uh, of Antarctica. And you can see uh, this is actually uh, the temperatures moving up into the atmosphere. Uh, and then within uh, two, four months, after these events occur, that temperature spreads around the globe. And it connects a lot of the records that we see uh, in, the, in the tropical cores. Uh, you can actually measure those from satellite. The, uh, these are actually um, monthly values, and these are running means, and you can see all the major El Ninos. These are elevations of the ice fields in the tropics. So this is a 500 millibar level. So you can look at temperature rise that occurs over Kalkaya, over Kilimanjaro, over uh, Papua New Guinea, where we've drilled cores. And you can see all those El Nino events as a temperature function at high, high elevation. And those impact uh, precipitation and temperatures uh, around the planet. And uh, these are based on historical observations. So temperatures in South America tend to be warm, as they do over in India, uh, and precipitation down in the Andes, down where the ice is, is usually dry. But if you're up in Ecuador, it's usually wet. And it's usually dry over in India, uh, uh, statistically, as you look at these. The other thing that's very interesting, if you look at uh, uh, diseases during El Ninos, uh, and these are medical papers that are published on malaria and, and childhood diarrhea and cholera, uh, the bubonic plague, under wet conditions, warm wet conditions. Then under the places that become dry, you have hyntus, uh, the Hynus virus, uh, river valley fever, and meningitis, and cardiovascular diseases from the smoke that comes from burning of forests when it's in the very dry areas. And then there are some diseases that seem to like the cycle, going from dry to wet, like uh, dingy fever and in influenza. And so there are a lot of connections to that uh, uh, variation of climate uh, on the planet. And in the ice core business, this is one of the things that can connect uh, across the uh, Pacific Ocean Basin. This, these cores are separated by 22,000 kilometers. If you go to Peru and you look at the impacts of these, uh, these events, uh, southern Peru is dry. This is where the ice cores come from. And uh, northern Peru and Ecuador are wet. And we have lots of different archives. We have lakes up in Ecuador. And we have the ice cores down in uh, uh, on the Alapano and, and southern Peru. And we know in this part of the world there's a huge uh, early pre-Spanish uh, cultures. Uh, there were uh, the Incas and uh, uh, the Tiwanaku cultures that rose and fell. And by taking this history that we have from uh, uh, the Kelkaya ice cap, we can actually work with archaeologists and anthropologists and look at what's the relationship uh, through time. And so if you look at the history of uh, cultures in this part of the world, uh, uh, you, can, you can look at uh, that relative to precipitation. So, so this is a core, this is from a lake up in Ecuador. And uh, the color coding, uh, when you get a lot of material washing in during El Ninos, you get this lighter uh, sediment in the lake. And uh, you can see here during this medieval climate uh, optimum, you have a lot of El Ninos. Uh, as recorded by floods going into the lake. But if you're down in the highlands in southern Peru, it's very dry during that period. And this suggests that there's some long-term oscillations happening here. So if you, if you look at the reconstructed uh, precipitation history here from the ice core, when it's dry, we have in Peru development of coastal cultures. 
and the capitals are on the coast. And uh, when it becomes wetter up in the highlands, then we have the, the highland uh, cultures like the Tiwanaku and the Wari developing, and the capitals are up in the highlands. And then when it becomes dry again, uh, the, the, these cultures disappear in the highlands and we get the coastal cultures and the, and the capitals are on the coast. And then when it uh, gets wet again at the, uh, at the onset of the Little Ice Age, we have the rise of the Inca Empire, which was the largest one in this, this part of the world. Of course, it came to an abrupt end when the Spanish arrived in 1531. But it's an interesting, if you look at uh, where we are today, uh, in the last 100 years, it's actually gotten wetter in the highlands. Uh, but if you look at how people have been moving out of, out of the highlands to the coastal areas, down to Lima, uh, since the early 1940s, uh, and now over half of Peru's population is actually in the drier coastal desert areas, and therefore very dependent on the water that's coming from the rivers coming out of, out of the Andes. And it's quite different than what happened through time. And now with uh, uh, genomics, they've actually been able to trace these people as they have moved from the highlands uh, to the lowlands. Uh, and there was a paper just uh, last year in the Proceedings of the National Academy uh, looking at this. So there's a history that's in, in the ice. Uh, and um, when we did the Kelkaya uh, cores, uh, uh, there were two things that stood out here that um, we've been looking at, and we, we still don't have the total answer on this. But you can see there's two big events in fluoride and chloride that occur. One is in the late uh, 18th century and one in the <coughs> mid 14th century. And uh, so we've been looking at these in the, where we have these very high annual records. Uh, in each of these sites, two in, in the Andes of South America and one in Tibet, it's annual back 250 years. And so if you look at those records, uh, we find that uh, all of these have, a, the isotope records are very highly correlated with uh, temperatures, SSTs in El Nino 3.4 region of the Pacific. Uh, and you can actually look at the, how that changes, and you, you see that these decadal oscillations in isotopes and in the SSTs uh, over uh, the period for which we have measurements of SSTs. Uh, and you can run these records back uh, 250 years. Uh, so these are the isotope records coming from uh, the Himalayas on one side of the Pacific, northern hemisphere, and then uh, from the tropics in the southern hemisphere in, in Peru. And you can see this uh, enrichment in all these uh, in the late uh, 18th century. And if you look at the changes over the period of this record, they've all enriched. The ones in South America by 1.44 parts per mil, and the, and the ones over in uh, the Himalayas, the highest place we've drilled, uh, by almost two and a half parts per mil over that period of time. But a very similar signal. So when we have these uh, El Nino events in the tropics, they have statistically impacts on precipitation in the U.S. And in Ohio, where I'm from, there's a bullseye of dryness <laughs> during the winters. But out here in Utah, uh, southern Utah tends to be wetter, and uh, northwestern tends to be drier. It's, it's a lot uh, less uh, 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 determining uh, the precipitation patterns in this part of the world. But California is often wet during those events, and certainly that would be good uh, in today's world. But these impact precipitation patterns over uh, in Asia. Uh, the, these are probabilities of below normal precipitation during El Nino periods, and uh, the Dunda, uh, or the Dasupu record comes from here. And then we have Peru, uh, northern uh, Peru and Ecuador wet, and uh, southern Peru dry, and uh, northeastern uh, Brazil uh, dr normally dry. And so you have uh, this pattern. And if you look at the geology in these areas, and, and you look at uh, potential sources of fluoride, is which is one of the parameters we measure, you don't usually find fluoride in ice core records. But if you go to India, these are where you find high fluoride concentrations in, in groundwater. And uh, so these, and these are the wind fields during uh, El Nino's during the wet seasons uh, since 1950. And if you go to South America, these are where you find high fluoride uh, concentrations. And this is the Bolivian high, you can see how the circulation is and how this could be picked up and carried to these uh, drill sites. 
if you look at aerosols in India, this is from NASA, and on, on October 28th, you can see all the aerosols being picked up in the Ganges plain and, and relative to where uh, the, the record is being recorded. And if you go to South America, we have these huge salt flats like Solar de Uni, which is the largest salt flat on Earth. And these are potential sources for windblown material. And uh, this is on, a, on, a, on a, a, a calm day and on a windy day, this stuff gets picked up and it gets carried up in the atmosphere and, and gets deposited. And uh, during periods when it's wet, and in this part of the world, it's often wet during uh, La Nina years. There's this oscillation that occurs. You get this film of water over uh, these solars. Uh, and if you actually compare, uh, say, fluoride levels in uh, the ice core from Kilkaya with water levels that have been measured on Lake Titicaca since uh, 1920, you can see that these are high lake levels and then they start to drop. And every time it drops, uh, about four and a half years, these glaciers are shrinking back into, or these lakes back into their basins, uh, you get these fluoride peaks uh, coming in uh, with a lag of about four to five years. So uh, black swans are rare and unpredictable events that have major impacts on the world. And this uh, comes from the U.S. National Intelligence Council looking at global trends looking out to 2030. And they say rapid changes in precipitation patterns such as monsoons in India and the rest of China could sharply disrupt the region's ability to feed its population. And so uh, it's interesting if you go to these sites uh, and look at uh, how these events under, uh, unfolded in uh, the late 18th century, uh, you find that in all of these, you have this very large uh, chloride spike that, that, that occurs during, during this period of time. And uh, if you look at uh, the fluoride, uh, uh, as we do here, this is going back uh, 250 years, uh, the fluoride is in black. You see you get a fluoride spike at about that same time also. And then there's an earlier spike that shows up on Kilkaya back in the middle of the 14th century. And it's the only two events that occur in the last 1,800 years. And so the question is, okay, what happened uh, historically in these periods of time? So if you look at the 18th century event, uh, in India this was known as the uh, East India Drought and it's centered on 1791. Uh, 11 million people died in that area uh, during this uh, drought, and uh, 600,000 uh, in north central India in 1792 alone. Uh, there were severe droughts in uh, uh, Java, down in Indonesia, in Australia, Mexico, Caribbean, Egypt. These are typical uh, precipitation patterns we see with modern uh, El Ninos. And there was a lot of uh, uh, social upheaval around those periods of time. Uh, so if you go back a thousand years and you look at uh, decadal averages, looking at our, our drought indicators, uh, you can see these events. Uh, uh, this one uh, in uh, the late 18th century. This, these are all in annually dated cores. This goes back annually to about 1420. So the earlier one is not well resolved in time. But it is, uh, on Kalkaya, these are annually dated. And you can see these are during these long-term droughts, and these are droughts within those periods. And, and if you look at India, uh, this is a map from 1795. And this, is, and this sector is where 600,000 people starved to death due to monsoon failures at that time. And if you go back 200 years, India didn't have 1.3 billion people like it has in today's world. Uh, uh, and if you, if you go to the earlier events, um, uh, this is, uh, if you go to over in China, this is a time of uh, the collapse of the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, this was established by the Mongols, uh, and it collapsed in 1368 during an extreme uh, mid-14th century drought and gave rise to the Chinese Ming Dynasty. And if you were over uh, in Europe, uh, this was a time of the plague, the outbreak of the plague, and the uh, uh, best understanding of the source of that is from bacterium that lived in the soils in the Gobi Desert region, and they got transplanted by 
fleas uh, uh, across with the trade that was just beginning at that time. But the question is why the bacterium is always in the soil and, and the general way it's seemed to have moved is from the soil to lice, to fleas, to black rats, and then ultimately uh, to humans. Uh, so if you look at that mid 14th century event, uh, the pandemic known as the Black Death uh, swept through Europe. 30 to 60% of the known population died at that time. When you go back, uh, getting global history is very, very difficult. And we know that it was uh, Yersinia pistis uh, because they found this on the bones of people who died during the plague in England. Uh, uh, and during that period, you had European social and political structures underwent massive re reorganization. Uh, uh, because previously plentiful cheap labor was no longer available to support uh, this, uh, the feudal system at that time. And then over in uh, Asia, the Mongol dynasty founded by Genghis Khan was overthrown in 1368 during this drought that lasted from AD 1353 to 1395. And so these are, these are two very extreme events. Uh, but the question is why they occur. And, the, the one thing that we know happened uh, at the beginning and the termination of uh, these, uh, when these events occurred, in the mid 14th century is when you're going into the Little Ice Age, which shows up in the isotope records, both in, in the Himalayas and over in the Andes in South America. And the uh, late 18th century is when you're going in the transition coming out of that. And one of the, the potential reasons for these changes in, pre in precipitation is the movement of this intertropical convergence zone. And this has been mapped out now using lakes and ice cores. And it was uh, much closer to the equator during the Little Ice Age period for about 300 years. And so when it shifts, you change the precipitation regimes. So that's something we, we're, we're still working on. But you can also look at the changes in isotopes over the last 2,000 years in the tropics. And if you look at that, these are decadal averages. You can see the medieval uh, climate anomaly, the Little Ice Age, and the enrichments in the 20th century. And if you look at reconstructions of northern hemisphere temperatures based on trees and historical observations and overlap with our instrumental record, what really stands out in all of these areas is how unusual the last 50 years have been. And the, uh, but probably the best uh, records, uh, this is a, a quote from Henry Pollock's book uh, called A World Without Ice. And it says, ice asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates, is not burned by any ideology, it carries no political baggage, as it changes from a solid to a liquid, it just melts. And so the ice is very telling. And so very rapidly, I'm going to take you around the world and show you what's happening with ice. Uh, this is Corey Kalis Glacier, the largest outlet glacier coming off of Kilkaya. We started measuring it in 1978. And this is going to morph into 2011. So you can see the ice uh, loss over uh, that period of time. Uh, and uh, the, if you, this is, this is uh, Kilkaya. This is Corey Kalis here. This is Cordillera of Velcomoda. This is a Landsat image taken in 1988. And you'll see all these lakes forming along the margins of these glaciers if you look at the same place 18 years later. So here's Corey Kalis, and now you can see the lake in here. And if you look at the ice loss, the area of ice loss, you can see this very large scale. And up here in the Cordillera of Velcomoda, we've lost about 24% uh, of the area of ice over 18 years. And the Kalkaya ice cap, since we started studying there, has lost 25% of its area. Uh, and these, this ice cap, uh, as it retreats, um, uh, uh, I mean, there are huge changes. You can see this is in 1977. This is all lake now. And by 2002, this is the backside of the lake. There's a person here for scale. This wall is about 100 feet high, and it's retreating every year. And at the base of this wall, we found a wetland plant. And it's perfectly preserved, and it's in growth position. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what it looked like when we found it. You can see where the wall is, right behind it. And this plant dates 5,200 years in age. And it tells us that this ice cap has not been smaller for 5,200 years, because as soon as they get exposed, they start to decay. 
So it's been under ice for that long. But what's been amazing is how fast that wall is retreating. So this is in 2002. Three years later, here's the plant, and you see where the wall is. And we've now collected over 60 plants as this uh, uh, retreat continues. And it can tell us a lot about the behavior of the glacier in the past. So uh, in uh, 1984, this was all ice. And uh, we collected uh, these old plants on this peninsula, and they all date about 4,700 years, carbon-14. Uh, in 2011, there were new land exposed on the other side. All the plants we collect there date 6,300 years in age. So it tells us 6,000 years ago, it took 1,600 years for the ice to move from here to capture the plants on this side. The retreat here from this side to expose this has taken place in 25 years. So it gives you an idea of the rate at which uh, the ice uh, is retreating relative to the rate at which it advanced. And if you go around the world and you look at what's happening to ice, you get a very similar picture. If you go to Alaska, this is the Muir Glacier, 1941. The glacier was over 800 feet uh, or 800 meters in this valley. And this was August of 2004. 98% of the glaciers in southeast Alaska are retreating in today's world. And when you look at these glaciers, just remember there's just water on land, and when they melt, they go in the world's oceans, and they contribute to sea level rise. This is a third pole region, uh, and these are the areas that we've drilled with our Chinese colleagues. This covers five million square kilometers. It's one of the largest glacier stores of fresh water, over 46,000 glaciers, sometimes referred to Asia's water tower. And it's very important as it serves as a source to many of the major rivers in that uh, part of the world. And geopolitically, it's very important because a river like the Indus fl flows through uh, th three nuclear power countries, uh, going from China through Pakistan and, uh, and India. And so, so these are very sensitive areas uh, when you talk about water resources going uh, forward in time. Hard to find very old pictures in the Himalayas, but here's one from 1921. And here's the same place in 2009. And you can see where the mountain peaks are. You see how much ice is melted out of that region. So working with our, our Chinese colleagues, we have now uh, uh, used uh, uh, aerial photos to look at uh, some 7,000 uh, glaciers across the third pole. Uh, they're all retreating, but they're retreating more. Well, these are since 1970. Uh, and they're, but they're retreating more down in the Himalayas and southeastern part of this region. Uh, uh, so, so you get a, a, an idea of the scale of, of the changes in that part of the world. If you go to the Alps, you can find old pictures. This is 1903. And if you look at uh, the same place in 2005, you can see where the glaciers are. Uh, today there are 5,000 glaciers in the Alps. Uh, it's estimated in 20 years, you know, half of those will be gone at the current rate of, uh, of ice loss. 99% uh, of the glaciers in that area are retreating. And when you go into the tropics, 100% of the glaciers are, are retreating. Um, this is uh, Kilimanjaro in Africa. These are the northern ice field, Furtwanger. We drilled here in 2000. And, uh, but you can get an idea of the size of the glacier. And uh, if you look at the oldest photos, this is from 1912. These are glaciers on the mountain coming up to 2006. Uh, the first map was made in 1912, and you can see where the ice was in 1912. And the last aerial photos we took were in January of 2013. And uh, so if you uh, look over this period of time, we've lost 88.3% of the area of ice on the mountain uh, since 1912, and 40% that was there in 2000 when we drilled was gone by 2013. Uh, if you look at where that ice is coming from, and you can lose ice uh, either by area or you can you lose it from uh, top down. And uh, if you look at the largest ice field, which is the northern ice field, you can see that 50% uh, is coming from area loss, uh, but the other 50% is coming from the thinning, uh, from the top down. So these glaciers are losing on the average of a half a meter of ice every year uh, from the top down. Uh, in today's world. 
And uh, we put a stake on the Fearwanger. Uh, this glacier is the smallest one. It was only nine and a half meters thick. So we put a drill stem in in 2000. And that has been measured uh, off and on ever since. And so here's where it was in 2000. And at 2013, it melted out. Uh, the ice has disappeared at that site. So two of the six sites where we drilled in 2000 are no longer there. And uh, this is a photo of Fjordwanger in 2013. And you can see it's broken up into these little pieces and you're exposing this darker surface so more radiation gets absorbed and, and the process speeds up as you're uh, coming forward uh, in time. Uh, over in Indonesia, uh, there is one glacier between the Himalayas and the Andes. Uh, and it's in the middle of this tropical rainforest. Uh, this is what it looked like in 1936, and this is what it looked like by 2001. Uh, these are uh, Landsat images uh, uh, in uh, 1989. The, the blue areas are the ice, and this is the same place 20 years later, in 2009. And you see a lot of these glaciers uh, disappeared over that 20-year period. Uh, we drilled there in 2010. This is, uh, we drilled on these, uh, these highest areas. The glacier is 32 meters thick. And this is where a tent sat for two weeks. And it rained every day on this glacier, and the tent protected the surface. And so the surface lowered 30 centimeters, 30 centimeters in that two-week period. And if you do the calculation, if this is any indication of the rate it's losing mass from the surface down, it's about seven meters uh, per year, and it's only 32 meters in thickness. So uh, 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 it's going to dis disappear very quickly. So if you take all the maps that have been made in, in that region, and uh, these are the black uh, dots that you see here, compared to Kilimanjaro in Africa, you can connect these and just project them into the future. And you see around 2018, at the current rate of ice loss, uh, those glaciers will disappear. And then you say, well, you know, how are those projections going? Uh, this is what the, the area looked like in 2010 when we drilled. And these are going to go to 2012 and up to 2014. And you can watch uh, these depressions that you see here. And you can also watch the margin of this cliff. So this is 2010. This is 2012. And this is 2014. So you can see how rapidly uh, that ice is disappearing from, from that area. And we think one of the drivers is that uh, we have a amplification in the tropics because of evaporation and latent heat release at the higher, higher elevations. So these are projected temperature rises by uh, the IPCC uh, with elevation in the tropics. And this is the elevation where all those glaciers are where we've recovered the records. So at these highest altitudes, the temperatures are expected to rise twice as fast as down at the surface. Uh, of the Earth. So they are very sensitive to change. But probably more importantly uh, in the big picture of things, what's happening with these uh, polar glaciers. And we had a fellow at uh, the Institute of Polar Studies who published a paper in Nature in 1978, uh, John Mercer, who talked about the instability of the West Antarctic ice sheet because it's uh, grounded below sea level. And uh, there's been a lot of measurements uh, in this part of Antarctica of uh, the Pine Island Glacier and, and the Twaits Glacier. And the uh, two publications in 2014 uh, about West Antarctica ice sheet is losing its mass and is very, uh, at a very rapid rate. And, it, and, and the loss appears to be unstoppable because it's moved back beyond its grounding points, which are islands out, out here. So normally what you, what you have with these uh, ice shelves is you have this uh, uh, warm circumpolar deep water coming in underneath the shelves that melts away the ice and, 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 and the uh, ice shelf breaks up above. But as the ice shelf decays, uh, uh, you get ice stream discharge increasing uh, and you get uh, uh, ice sheet decay <coughs> taking place. So in a normal uh, setting, this is what you would expect. Uh, but this is a slower process because these glaciers are grounded above sea level. But in the case of uh, West Antarctica, the, the grounding, uh, you're actually going further and further below sea level as you go back underneath this uh, ice sheet. And, uh, and the warmer water continues. And the only question is how fast 
uh, will that uh, ice sheet uh, uh, disintegrate uh, if this uh, 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 is correct. And, but we can look at uh, what's happening to glaciers around the world, and this actually shows the cumulative uh, cubic miles of, 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 of uh, ice that have disappeared uh, globally. Look at mountain glaciers and, and uh, polar glaciers. And then you can look at sea level, how that's changing. And if you go back to 1900, uh, it was rising at about 0.8 millimeters per year. And then from 1925 to 1992, it's about 1.9. And by the time you get to 1993 to 2012, it's 3.1 millimeters per year. Uh, and so you can see that acceleration taking place. So it's, it's uh, certainly, if you look at the world as a whole, all these red areas are where we're losing ice on land. And so climatologically, we're in unfamiliar territory, and the world's ice cover is responding dramatically to these changes. Uh, but you're going to ask the question, what if you lost 8% of the ice that's now on land? What would that do to, to sea level? And I've showed you that uh, for the Kelkai ice cap, we've lost 25% of the area of that uh, ice field since, since I was a graduate student. So, so if you lost 8% globally, and you were to look at the U.S. Gulf Coast region, uh, down in New Orleans and Florida, if you lost 8% of the ice that's on land, uh, this is what the coastline would look like. And of course, we have cities at sea level around the world because they were settled with sailing ships, and this is where people settled and cities developed, and that's where commerce takes place. So uh, what happens to those uh, glaciers and ice sheets becomes very critical as we go into the 21st century. So I want to talk a little bit about how we manage a world with threats from climate change, rising sea levels, and rising energy uh, consumption. And so you, could, you can make a very strong case that there's a perfect storm brewing, and the ingredients include the fact that these greenhouse gases like CO2 uh, have a resonance time of over 1,000 years. The climate system has an inertia. It takes 20 to 30 years for it to respond. It takes a long time to warm up ice sheets and oceans. Uh, we have these positive amplifying feedbacks in the system. If you melt the Arctic sea ice, you expose darker water, more absorption. If you melt the glaciers, you expose more land. You get more energy absorption. And we consume a lot of fossil fuels globally. And you can talk about a, uh, a brighter future with more renewables, cleaner air, water, enhanced economic development, better jobs. And I was just in Iowa uh, two weeks ago. And Iowa now gets 30% of their electricity in the state from wind power. So there's a, a change uh, taking place uh, in, in uh, adopting these new alternative energies. But to get back to people and us, uh, to me, the thing that gets our attention are the extremes. So from Ohio, 2011 is the wettest year ever recorded in Ohio since we've been keeping uh, precipitation uh, histories. And there's a lot of damage that comes from floods associated with that. But uh, there are also lots of floods in other parts of the world uh, in 2011. And this is in Pakistan. And Munich Re, uh, who insures insurance companies, uh, uh, estimated the overall loss uh, due to weather and, uh, and storms was 148 billion globally, of which 55 billion was actually insured or covered. And that means governments or individuals pick up uh, that difference. And if you come forward in time, we have storms like Sandy that hit uh, New York and New Jersey. Uh, that's 60 billion and counting uh, cost. Uh, and things that we don't often think about, there are 45 Superfund toxic waste sites within a half a mile of the coast in New York and New Jersey. And those become uh, vulnerable to increasing oceans, the higher storm surges that come inland. So uh, the cost, and then if you look at fires, areas burn is uh, very important out in this, this area. And what's really striking about these numbers are the years in which these maximum burns occurred. You know, 9.8 million acres, uh, 9.3 million, 9.1 million, uh, all very recent. Uh, and then the, uh, these floods in unusual places. This is in Colorado in 2013. Uh, this was considered to be a thousand year flood, almost $2 billion worth of uninsured losses 
because it doesn't flood there and people don't normally have uh, insurance. So it brings back one of those human uh, characteristics, consequences for the individual outweigh consequences for others. If you or people that you, your loved ones get impacted, then climate becomes more real. When we know that none of these individual events can be tied to climate change, but it's the numbers uh, globally that you, that you have to be concerned about. And you see uh, with a lot of storms now, these super, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this hit the Philippines in 2013, uh, 14 billion in losses, but most people in the Philippines don't have insurance. Uh, and then extremes. Uh, this was uh, in 2014, this is in Atlanta, the, the snow and, and the cold there. And at the same time, if you were down in Australia, they were setting records in that part of the world. Uh, if you go to England in 2014, uh, this, was, uh, the, uh, this was the wettest on record since records began in 1910 in the UK Met Office. And, uh, uh, and that was about $1.7 billion worth of losses. Then you come up to this winter. In the east, we've had uh, uh, record snowfalls, the, these uh, massive uh, storms that really uh, choked the northeast. Uh, uh, and uh, then uh, out in the west, of course, we have California, uh, which is now uh, is, uh, experiencing a 500-year drought. And just uh, last week, uh, there were uh, uh, the, the current uh, snowpack it covers is, is only about 18% of uh, average. And uh, you know, the implications of that, there's so many people, uh, uh, are, are tremendous. And then uh, just uh, uh, this past week, Cyclone Pam that went through uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the southern Pacific Ocean, and uh, this uh, did uh, uh, a lot of damage, and in fact, 90% uh, of the buildings on, on the island were destroyed by this Category 5 uh, cyclone. And uh, so uh, this is in uh, uh, Vanuatu. And so, so there are these extremes are occurring around the world. But the people who really watch this are uh, these insurance companies. And so here is uh, the losses. These are weather-related losses. And if you look at the last 10 years, it's averaged about 184 billion a year, of which 56 billion were covered by insurance. And a lot of this depends on where these storms hit. So you can see when Katrina hit uh, in 2005, the cost, and there was a lot of insurance coverage uh, because we generally cover, a lot of us have, have insurance. And so those become very expensive for these very large insurance companies. So this brings about another human characteristic, uh, immediate consequences outweigh delayed consequences. And so and when I look at the future, and I think we have, we have three options to look at. One is mitigation. And this means taking measures to reduce the pace and the magnitude of changes in global climate that are created by human activities. And here you can talk about uh, 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 reducing emissions of greenhouse gases. You can talk about enhancing sinks for those greenhouse gases, taking them out of the atmosphere. You can talk about geoengineering uh, uh, to counteract the effects of, 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 of the warming. You can talk about adaptation, which means taking measures to reduce the adverse impacts on human well-being that result from climate change that do occur. And examples would be changing agricultural practices, uh, strengthening defenses against climate-related diseases, uh, building more dams and dikes. Uh, but these are moving targets, and we're not very good at looking at regional impacts. And then the third is suffering. And that's the adverse impacts that are not avoided by mitigation or adaptation. So, uh, uh, you know, how you approach those, uh, those are political issues. But, but I think if you, if you think about it, those are, 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 are your adaptation mechanisms. Now I must say, after my experience over the last couple of years, I have come to really understand uh, uh, people who are uh, climate skeptics. And I take this from a personal point of view. Uh, 20 uh, years ago, I was diagnosed with exercise-induced asthma. And uh, I, uh, in, in 2009, after an expedition, I came back and I uh, went to the Ross Heart Hospital and they told me that I had congestive heart failure. 
And my doctor said, told me, he said, Ronnie, this is what's going to happen. He said, you're on a plateau. And he said, you're going to drop to another plateau. And, and he, he said, hopefully you'll hold there for a while. But he said, in your future, you have one option and one option only, and that is to get a heart transplant. And I said, you got to be crazy. I, this old heart has taken me to 23,500 feet in the Himalayas. I, at that time, run 53 expeditions. And so I fought him every step of the way through defibrillators. Uh, and two years later, when I was drilling in the Alps at, uh, on Orpheus, one day I got up and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get from my tent to, to the drill site. And I got out of there and got back, went directly to Lost Heart Hospital and went in and was on a heart pump uh, immediately. And that's only good for five days. Developed one of these terrible infections. Uh, my wife and daughter were told that I probably wouldn't make it, uh, but I did. Uh, they broke, and then they put in a, a uh, one of these LVADs, these left ventricle assist devices, which is a turbine that they put in the old heart, and you have a drive line that comes out, and uh, you run on electricity and a computer. And I was so I was in the hospital uh, four months. One stage I weighed 138 pounds. I had to learn to walk again. If, if you've ever been in a hospital bed for very long, you, it's amazing how quickly you, you deteriorate. And, uh, but when I got out, uh, 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 I continued uh, to work. Uh, and here's the computer. Uh, this is my wife and I uh, won in April 2012 the Ben Franklin Medal of Science. So we had to go up to Philadelphia uh, to get that. But underneath the code are the battery packs that are running the computer and the turbine. And at night, I would plug into the wall. And, and so it, it gives you a whole new feeling for you know, a reliable energy source. Uh, uh, there. But uh, uh, three days after getting back from this, uh, I went back to the Ross Heart Hospital. They had found a match. And I got a transplant. Two weeks later, I was out. And uh, one year later, I was at 20,000 feet in west central Tibet with this new heart. And, and the reason I, I tell the story is that I fought this because I had an option. If it was exercise-induced asthma, that's OK, because there's a medicine for it. And, and you can continue to go into the field and do what you've been doing your whole life. If it's congestive heart failure, you put that on your medical form, there's no way you're, uh, they're going to allow you to go out into the mountains. So. So, uh, th but this was the reality, uh, and I just didn't want to accept it. But at the end of the day, we deal with what is. And when it comes to issues of climate change, it doesn't really matter what I think or any of us think. It only matters what is, and this is a matter of physics and chemistry. And at the end of the day, we will deal with it because we will have no choice in that. So when I look at the 21st century, uh, I'm generally uh, very optimistic uh, that we can tackle these issues once we realize we have to. Uh, but I think our biggest challenges will be learning to, uh, how to get along with each other on this planet with 7.3 billion people. And you can discuss how well we're doing that today. It's been with us for a very long time. But the other one is learning how to get along with the planet to allow it to support the life that we all know and love. And to me, these two challenges deal with human behavior, and therefore they're very closely related as we go forward. So let me close by just simply saying that uh, if we learned anything from our international space programs, it's how unique this planet is uh, in, our, in our solar system and anything else we can see out there. And when we talk about issues like climate change, the real fact is that nature is a timekeeper on this. And unfortunately, none of us are wise enough to see the clock, to know how much time you have to adapt to change. Uh, but we do have lots of evidence that that clock is, in fact, ticking. And uh, so we, we need to move on this issue. And to me, it's only a question of when uh, and not if. So thank you very much, and I really appreciate uh, your attention. Yes, sure. Or comment. Yes. So you're saying we have to uh, get to 20,000 feet and realize we can't breathe before we're going to do anything about climate change? 
Well, I, I think there is something about human nature. If we have two alternatives, in the case of climate change, you know, a lot of people argue uh, for the natural forcings in the system. And of course they are there and they've always been with us. But on top of that, we now have these very dominant human forcings. Uh, but the, you, can, you can speculate on what it would take to uh, really bring about a large scale change. I, I don't think there's any question that we can do it. I think it's having the political will to do it and then what it takes to make that happen. And, and I can tell you that I was, uh, a number of years ago, uh, uh, Senator McCain brought some scientists and brought the heads of these insurance agencies, presidents of companies in the U.S., but also CEO from Swiss Re. And in the presentation, the CEO from Swiss Re said, had Katrina hit the U.S. in 2001, rather than 2005, that it would have brought down the whole international insurance business. And the reason was that they were reeling from the tech crash in 2000, and then there was 9-11 in 2001. And because of 9-11, they were able to uh, increase rates on aircraft and all the things that insurance companies uh, insure. And so they had a buffer by the year 2005 to cover those huge expenses. But it really says that you know, everything is a matter of a nexus of events. Uh, you know, when, when these things come together, and it raises the question, how many of our systems you know, are, are, are subject to those, those type of uh, 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 random events uh, that can, can occur as you go forward? And certainly that would change people's opinion very, very rapidly uh, if you had that kind of an, an event. Well, the, you know, the National Academy of Sciences has looked into this, and, and you know, certainly, uh, to, to me, you know, all the geoengineering things, uh, these are things that you have to be really concerned about uh, uh, because of the unintended consequences. But at the same time, you need to look at uh, the, the, the potential, and the idea that you could take the uh, carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into the storage is, uh, you know, the reason we have natural gas deposits and oil deposits is these have been sealed areas in the crust, and if you could use those or put them in the bottom of the ocean, uh, there, I mean, there, there are uh, potential uh, 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 options out there. And, uh, you know, people look at putting you know, sulfates up in the stratosphere, like volcanoes do, which will cool the temperature for one or two years, but if you continuously put it up there, but you have the energy it takes to do that, and then you have the fact that that only might impact temperature, and it doesn't take care of the acidification problem that we have in the global oceans. So, but I think that we need to think about, you know, what would be the options if we find ourselves in a much uh, worse shape much quicker than we expect. Yes. Well, I, I, think we're, I think we're losing opportunities because if you think about the ice core community, when, when I was a student, all the, all the pioneers were alive in this field. It's a very young field. And I don't think we, uh, we have uh, touched what's possible, the potential of looking in these archives. Uh, I mean, we've been working with some medical doctors looking at bacteria and viruses. I mean, ice preserves anything that's in the air, uh, and it preserves it. If you can find a million-year-old ice core, you can look at how things have changed over that, that period of time. So I think when we lose the ice, we lose a very valuable resource. But it's, to me, it's daunting to think that in the Alps, uh, where glaciology, as we know it, the observations uh, developed with Agassiz and others, that there are 5,000 glaciers there, and in 20 years, half of those will be gone. And it's, it would be a, a sad world, in, from my perspective, uh, when uh, you can't go and see these spectacular uh, forms that we have on our mountain regions and our, and our polar regions uh, on the planet. 
So, so I think losing the archive has a whole kind of feedbacks to uh, us as humans and as we see our, as we see our world. I think we're going to close now, and but uh, Vladi would be happy to stay for a bit and answer any further questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you.